not cause that idolatry. Because it's all part of nature. In other words, it's closed. In other words, there is nothing outside of the system. Okay? Do you, that's important. Now, imagine now in this world of closed system, whether you say there is God or not, comes another system. Now, I have that arrow there just to point out that you can have blends and mixes and different kind of religions. But there is a spectrum there. Okay? Now, if I bring Moses or a prophet and I ask him to answer the fundamental questions of life, this is what they would answer. Now read it, you are all familiar. Do you agree Moses or prophets would answer this way? Can I move it? That's an open system because it argues that Yahweh is outside of nature. Yahweh created everything, but he can step in. Now, in open system, do you and I have right or do we have ability to to judge it to judge that god who comes from outside we are part of creation do we have ability to to say who this god is what is his nature whether he's right or wrong i mean do we have that Obviously, we don't. We don't. We know about God only what He revealed to us. Yes, but follow me. I'm trying to lead you to something here. Okay, so the scriptures that we have, it's written by human beings. But the scriptures is, is, what do we mean when we say inspired? The writers were inspired. That means God sent them. If a, God sends a person to write, then the person is inspired. If a person writes on his own and claims to be from God, but God did not send the person, then that's a false prophet. Uh, it's up to you and me to decide, figure it out how. In the previous generations, people have decided. It started with the writings of Moses and continued until the first century. And it seems like God stopped there. Well, Christians codified. First, the Jews codified what we call the Old Testament. Then Christians kind of codified what we call the New Testament. And it seems like it stopped there. And it, about, I don't know, 17, 18 centuries passed by. And it seems like God is not talking anymore. At least we codified the, the Bible. We, we made it. This is codified. This is it. Nobody can add more. Well, the Catholic Church decided that there is more tradition is added to it. It's of equal value. We Adventists don't value writings of Augustine, Aquinas, and the others as of the prophets for the reasons that we have. But we have another prophet that we believe God spoke through in the 19th century. Now, I can go through history, demonstrate to you, I believe that for centuries the church has slowly distancing itself from the scriptures and has apostatized to the point that God, and then you have the pressure of the scientific community by the 19th century, that I believe that God had to send another prophet in order to save the remnant. I can demonstrate that, but that takes a lot of time to explain. 
uh, if it were not, what is the greatest contribution that Ellen White gave us? In my conclusion, the greatest contribution. Forget health message, everything. The greatest contribution is her argument. If you don't believe my writings, you go back to the scriptures. That, that, that is, uh, from a practical point, that's a self-defeating. I mean, like saying, if you don't believe my writings, read something else. I mean, all false prophets, they argue that their, their message is the superior. That's the latest, the superior to the scripture. And she says, no, okay, you don't believe my writings, all right. But go back to the scripture. And I believe if it were not for her, our movement will never jump. Because these uh, different understandings, difficulties to understand the text, under the pressure of Christian tradition and scientific community, God needed a prophet in order to revive uh, his people and to keep them together. So now, uh, okay, you see now we have this, uh, one arrow tells you, this, this blue circle tells you there is no God. These two circles are both agreeing there is supernatural. Well, the red line tells you this is all closed system, that's an open system. This is legitimate tree. And I'm saying is that you can have on this spectrum, this is what I call tripolar spectrum. My question now is, what each of these offers you. Blue circle, this particular worldview tells you, tells you about yourself, answers all the fun fundamental questions of life. Do you find meaning in that circle? You live, you, okay, you are born, you live and you die. That's it. The other circle tells you, yes, there is spiritual, you born, you live, and then you either unite with Brahman, which means, again, you are one with, with you, as a person, you cease to exist. When I talked with a Hindu priest, I mean, a, a believer, and he was telling, I asked him, are you telling me that my objective in life should be to reach moksha, to become one with Brahman? He says, yeah. I said, but that means that once I'm one with Brahman, I cease to exist as a person. I said, yeah. He says, well, you're telling me I, my objective in life is to be nothing. That I, to cease to exist as a person. Well, thank you very much for that. That's not what I want. What does the upper one tell you? What does Jesus offer? You will exist as a person forever, except that you will be healthy as he originally intended you to be when he created Adam and Eve. At least in a, on a practical level. And I'm using that kind of a conclusion because I ask people, okay, I gave you all these dozen of fundamental questions of life. What do you think is the question? One that everybody asks. Because some of these questions, some people may not, never ask. But there is one question that everybody asks. And that is the question of death. Why do I have to die? And what is after death? All of us want to know that. Why? Because we want to live. The death question, the evil question, that question, that, those issues are the very important ones. Now, you may ask me, what does this have to do with, and I'm now going to conclude, what does this have to do with emerging church? I showed you this diagram. This is Tayard, theistic evolutionism. This is his diagram. I transferred this diagram uh, graphically into something else. 
Now, hold on just a second here. I have to move this picture. All right, now it's better. Now, ignore what you see there on the top. Look down at the bottom. Tayardian, this is theistic evolutionist diagram. Tayard argues that billions of years, everything started with Big Bang, an evolutionary process driven by principle of emergence. These are evolutionary processes. They are defined not by, he says this, these evolutionary processes are not defined by the origins, but by its direction. So see, that's different. He's diff he differs from Charles Darwin. You see that green there on the bottom line. Emergence, many emergents are not fully aware of this, but those who are fully aware of Tayardian works, they, 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 this is how they understand. They believe that we Christians today, we are responsible. Jesus gave us that task to work and create and make the kingdom of God here and now. That's the green that you see. They often call it the age of the spirit. This is the age of Christogenesis. Christ, cosmic Christ, Christ incarnated himself. And his task is to take the entire creation. Now we have convergence to take it to Omega. At one point down in the future. See, evolutionary process still goes on. It's not, we have not reached it. We still have to keep going according to him. And we become one with Omega. Now, what I have at the top there, that's a biblical. Now that one is in proportion to approximately thousand years, okay? This one cannot be proportional because I'm talking about billion years. My I don't have enough space, okay? Now, have you noticed that the green again, the very beginning, that was God intended when he created Adam and Eve. Sin enters and the kingdom of God is lost. He makes a promise. You see at the very top there in Genesis 3.15, he makes a promise. At the crucifixion, he won the victory, and from that point on, we Satan knows he lost the battle, and Jesus is the victor. But it's not realized yet. Things have to happen, and it is only after reestablishment, destruction of evil, and reestablishment of the kingdom of God, what God intended, it's going to be recreated at the end. Now, what you see there in purple, that is my attempt to point out to the atonement. If, you ask, if, if people ask you, how do you know Jesus is coming soon? What are you going to say? How do you know Jesus is coming soon? Pardon me? Bible says, but what is it that Bible says? We talk about signs, but Jesus said all of this was happening, it's going to keep happening. So the intensity, it's there, yes, acceleration, is the prophecy, which prophecy? That's right, 1844 is the last day that we have. Now we are in a period of time, we are waiting. This is the atonement, the day of atonement. It's taking place. And so I, that's why I have that purple there. Now my question to you is, I can go into explaining what I mean by apostasy. Every time you have apostasy, and to me the biggest sign that Jesus is coming soon is the moral decline of society. Not the wars and earthquakes and that. That happens. What is happening before our eyes right now, 
moral decline and unbelief is taking over. And the question is, how many will hold onto the truth? And I believe the, the, the critical mass will come to a point. Yes, I believe there will be miraculous shifting. People leaving and people getting into God's church. But at the same time, there will be a lot of Satan wants to destroy God's people. There will come a moment when God has to act to save his people. He will never allow Satan to have total control of humanity. It's not going to happen. So, my question to you is now, having seen all this worldview shift, what I'm trying to show you is that the answers to all of the fundamental questions of life are being changed by new ideas and concepts and what we call emergence theology. And what I'm doing in my book, I'm trying to explain all of that. Every single fundamental question of life that you have seen, that I showed you, Brian, people like Brian McLaren and Doug Jones, I mean, Doug Padgett, uh, Tim, uh, Tim Jones, all of these guys, when Brian McLaren says, we want to deconstruct traditional Christianity and introduce new Christianity, what they mean by that, what he means by that is, I want to give you Christianity which has completely new assumptions. That's happened to all the fundamental questions of life, not only one or two. You see, for many centuries, we Christians, Protestants and Catholics believed similar things. There are differences, but there are similarities. For many, many centuries and many, I mean, for many decades, we Adventists assumed and believed, and maybe it was true, that there were certain teachings that were the same for Catholics and Protestants and for us. What is happening now, my friends, polarization is taking place. It's not important anymore whether you are Methodist or Episcopalian or Lutheran, because Protestantism is succumbing to emergentism. And it is emergentism, this emergence Christianity, which I believe, and I can see it, it's taking people to the early medieval theology. That means back to the mother church. So now I'm going to tell you something. This is my interpretation. I'm, this is not going to go into the book. This is for you. I am more and more convinced we are talking here about the beast out of the earth from chapter 13, book of Revelation. This is the beast who looks like a lamb, but it speaks like dragon, and it will lead the world not to worship self, but to worship the first beast. The evidence is it just... It's overwhelming. I think we are more and more what's happening. Of course, not everybody will become emergent. There are a lot of evangelicals who are fighting back. But I believe that this will force many to go back to the scriptures. And many of them, okay, will give in. Some of them will probably join us. And my argument is we Adventists must not follow this development, I mean, join them. We must stand up and become the light to the world. In other words, we must be seen because we will be the only ones who still say, thus says the Lord. We still hold to the scriptures. 
That's where the repository of spiritual authority is. So that the others can see where to go. That's my, my conviction. So, some of us who are kind of imitating, we are do, making a mistake. We are not. When my students tell me, oh, we are just like another church. Ooh, hold on, hold on. That's what the devil wants you to believe. We are not just like another church. If we are, then I mean, close the door, my goodness, go and join them. What's the point? Having just a different building. No, we are not. We are called to be light to the world. People have to see where to go. And so this fundamental changes, when you, once you understand this worldview concept, you understand who you are, then you can understand the Buddhists, the Hindus, the atheists, where they come from, because you understand their assumptions. But at the same time, you understand what is happening. These fundamental assumptions are being changed. And I'll end over this. So, oh my goodness, there is a dinner. Ah, oh, don't, don't clap. Um, Guys, what I need is, you keep praying for what I'm working on. It's, it's very difficult and it's extremely comprehensive. My work will eventually be something like scratching the surface. And I hope later people can go deeper into every subject. Because I am addressing Second Vatican Council, I'm addressing mysticism, I'm addressing evolutionism, theistic evolutionism. Uh, I mean, every single subject ad that relates to these fundamental questions of life. And one human being cannot do it. And so, uh, pray for me that God helps me conclude this and then let others pick up on it, younger people, and do more with it because, but we must hold onto the scriptures and spirit of prophecy. We must be light to the world, city on the hill. We must be not, we must be different, not for the sake of being different, but because God needs us to be different and the world needs to know where to go. Okay? Would you play, pray, please, or dismiss them? Thank the Lord. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we have heard much. We thank you for this wide angle view of what is happening around us. As darkness gathers and gains steam, we thank you for helping us understand the general direction. And we pray. As, as we have been appealed to today, that you will help us to not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ, not to be ashamed of being a peculiar people, and that you, your, that our peculiarity would be that we will hold fast to Christ and to his word. We'll have that primitive godliness. Give us that experience, we pray. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We are far deep into our schedule. For those of you that uh, have bought dinner, have dinner, by faith, let's go to the calf as the children of Israel. Pray, pray that the doors will open and there will still be milk and honey. We'll come back here at about 20 after 7 for our evening program.